government and charge them 60 cents for it, shoving a good bit of the cost into the future on the unconsenting, because as yet unborn, future generations that are going to have to pay for this. This represents, I'm bound to say, a decadence of our democracy. We used to borrow for the future. We fought wars for the future. We built rivers, uh, dams, highways, airports for the future. Now we are borrowing from the future to finance our own current consumption of government goods and services. And if that isn't decadence, I don't know what is. And the problem in Washington, there's a, of course we hear a lot about the discord, and that's real enough. But the real problem in Washington is a consensus. It's as broad as the Republic and deep as the Grand Canyon, and it is this. Everyone has agreed that we should have a large, generous welfare state and not pay for it. Someone else should pay for it. People say, well, yes, we're borrowing all that money from China. It's worse than that. The biggest purchaser of U.S. government debt is the U.S. government itself through the Federal Reserve. Now, if that sounds like a Ponzi scheme, it's not my fault. This is what we're facing. For six years now, we have had essentially zero interest rates. As a result of this, this is trickle-down economics practiced by a Democratic administration. All the money has flowed in, away from bonds and into equities in search of higher yields. This is of great benefit to the 10% of Americans who own 80% of all the directly owned stocks. In fact, in all the income gains, 2009 through 2012, four years, 95% of the income gains went to the top 1% of income earners in the United States. The two most important decisions the average family makes is one, to get a mortgage loan, and the other is to get a loan for a college tuition. Those are now, in one way or another, transactions with the federal government. The energy sector is permeated with politics, the Keystone Pipeline being just the most conspicuous example. <laughs> Even before the Affordable Care Act was passed, 50 cents of every health care dollar in this country was a government dollar. On and on it goes. We have seen the government grow more rapidly than ever before, and we've had a slower recovery than ever before from a recession. Some people think that's a coincidence. Some of us think it's cause and effect. This is unacceptable. The country is now in a kind of dreary new normal where we're asked to get used to slow economic growth. But 40% of all recent college graduates 40% are either unemployed or in a job that does not require a college degree. This is, a, as I say, unacceptable, and it's going to get worse because we're now nearing the crisis of the welfare state, which can be put very simply. The welfare state exists to transfer wealth from the working young and middle-aged to the retired elderly. It's a huge regressive transfer of wealth because the elderly, after a lifetime of accumulation, are the wealthiest age cohort in the country. Demography is destiny for a welfare state, and our population is aging. Combine the aging of a population with an entitlement system such as ours, you have a recipe for a crisis. And the crisis began, in a sense, on the 1st of January 2008, when the first of 77 million baby boomers began to retire. They began to turn 62, at which age, and this is preposterous, and I will return to it in a minute, at which age a majority of Americans begin to collect Social Security. The welfare state today exists to subsidize two things that did not exist in 1935 when, with enactment of the Social Security system, we began to build a welfare state. The two things that didn't exist are protracted retirement and competent medicine. By the time all the baby boomers have retired in 2030, the average age of the American population coast to coast will be higher than it is today in the state of Florida, which is justly known as God's antechamber. <laughs> I say it's easy to fix Social Security. I'm there's a wonderful story of a British war council during World War I when they were just coming to terms with the problem of submarine warfare. Some smart aleck at the end of the table says, I know what to do about submarine warfare. We will boil the Atlantic. <laughs> and I said, well, how, how, do, how do we do that? And they said, well, that's not my problem, that's implementation. 
If in 1935 we had indexed the retirement age to life expectancy, the retirement age in America today would be 74, we'd have no social security crisis. Change the indexation of benefits from wages back to inflation, half the unfunded liability disappears. Simple to fix. In the 20th century, the average length of retirement from when the worker left the workforce and when he or she died expanded from two years to 20 years. 1935, retirement was a luxury of a tiny sliver of the American population. People worked until they were almost dead, and then they died. 50 years ago, we were spending 6% of GDP on health care. Today, we're spending 18%. But modern medicine is such a recent phenomenon. Right about the time I was born, sulfa drugs, antibiotics, and with the Second World War on the horizon, penicillin came along. But even Probably a third to a half of all the medical treatments in use today did not exist in 1965 when we passed Medicare. Care to guess how many coronary bypass operations Medicare paid for in 1965? I'll give you a hint. It's exactly the same number as the number of artificial hips and knees it paid for. Zero. The average American couple age 65 joining Medicare this year will have paid about $109,000 over their lifetime in Medicare taxes. They will take out of Medicare $350,000 of benefits. It's more than a quarter of a million dollars per couple deficit. The interesting thing is John McCain got health care right in 2008, which is really weird because John is not interested in domestic policy. If it doesn't fly or explode, he doesn't care. McCain said, look, treat employer-provided health insurance as what it manifestly is, compensation, and tax it, but give people large tax credits to go into the market and shop for health care, and let them shop across state lines. You go home and turn your television on tonight, you're going to see an ad for Geico Auto Insurance competing with State Farm Auto Insurance, competing with Progressive Auto Insurance, competing with Allstate. You won't see that for health care because you're not allowed to buy health care across state lines, which is so dumb, even a caveman can understand it. <laughs> Congress, always helpful, passed wage controls so people could not compete for scarce labor by raising wages. So American industry said, we'll get around Congress by offering our employees Health care as untaxed compensation. 1943, the IRS said, fine, we won't tax it. Let me uh, suggest a thought experiment. Suppose in 1942 and 43, businesses had said, we're not going to provide our employees health care, we're going to buy their groceries. What would a grocery store look like today? I don't think there'd be any prices, and I can prove my point by asking you a question. I want a show of hands. How many of you, when you go to the doctor and he or she says, I want to give you the following test, how many of you say, how much is that going to cost? About six liars. <laughs> Why do you ask? The doctor probably doesn't know. There's no, we have no price system functioning in our system. Well, this is what we have to come to grips with because this is crowding out everything else in the budget. We're disarming. When Mike Mullen, the was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen said, rightly, the deficit is our principal national security problem. The duty of government clearly stated in the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and governments are instituted among men to secure those rights, secure rights that are pre-existing to government. Government doesn't give us our rights. We give government just such powers to protect and secure our rights. So, the framers in Philadelphia built a government full of blocking mechanisms. Three branches of government, two branches of the legislative branch, veto, veto override, supermajorities, judicial review, all kinds of ways of slowing it down. And yet I can think of nothing that the American people have wanted intensely and protractedly that they didn't get. 
So when people say the government's not working, that's not quite right. The government has its, Lord knows, has its problems, but it's supposed to be difficult. You're supposed to have concurrent majorities. You have to have a majority in the House with its own constituencies and electoral rhythms. You have to have a majority in the Senate, different constituencies, different electoral rhythms. It's supposed to be hard. We are a rich, prosperous, industrious, educated nation. We can get better by choosing to get better, which means choosing better policies, which means choosing better policy makers. It's in our hands. You know, Winston Churchill, who loved our country as much as he loved his American mother, said the American people invariably do the right thing after they have exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> and we're pretty far down the list, but I think the American people have not had their character changed. I, I firmly believe, I don't want to sound partisan, but I firmly believe that the current administration in Washington is trying to change social norms to get Americans reconciled to dependency on the government in order to change national character. But they haven't done it yet. I think the American people still understand that when Jack Kennedy said, that's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, one thing you can do for your country is to reserve a spacious portion of your life for which your country is not responsible. I'm sure the American people understand what Milton Friedman meant when he said, look, take any three letters from the alphabet, doesn't matter which ones. Put them in any order you want, doesn't matter. You will have an acronym designated in a federal agency we can do without. <laughs> the fifth largest expenditure, uh, about $6 of every $100, is the interest. And that interest is growing. And you've written recently and commentated recently that as bad as the interest situation is now on the national debt, we're paying historically low rates on our interest. What happens when we get back to 5% interest? The budget explodes. Right now, the interest, that is the money we're paying to rent the money we've already borrowed, is so low because of zero interest rate policy for six years. When the cost of government borrowing goes back to what it was for, say, 30 years before this, which is about 5.5% as opposed to, what are we paying now, 1.5%? One, one mm -hmm. That will explode. That will just triple. The biggest, when that happens, the biggest driver of the debt will be the debt. It will drive itself. It will compound almost. And um, I, I thought it was going to quit depressing people, but... Uh, this is our future. Every candidate, every policy proposal should be judged by one standard now. Does it or does it not contribute to accelerating economic growth? That's the danger, is that we're being asked to accept a new normal. I mean, we, a report will come out and say 175,000 new jobs created. Big deal, you have to create 125,000 new jobs every month just to keep up with the normal growth of the labor force. Review Magazine. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a friend of mine, came to my house six times for dinner as he was president. My conservative credentials are in good order, thank you very much. And I think Jeb Bush is right on immigration. I'm telling you. There are 11 million illegal immigrants here, and they're not going home, okay? People say, no amnesty. What do, what do we call this if we're not going to deport them? And the American people, in their native good sense and decency, would not tolerate the police measures necessary to rip from our community people who have been here, 40% of them five years or more, Seven million of them in the workforce. You sit next to them in church. They serve you in your restaurants. They're not going home. I did the arithmetic. To deport 11 million people would require a line of buses, bumper to bumper, from San Diego to Alaska. It's not going to happen. So the question is, what do we do about it? 
My immigration policy is for every 10 immigrants, we deport one tenured professor in this country. <laughs> <laughs> not at PBA, not at PBA. We need the immigrants. They are working. Immigrants start small businesses in this country. Small businesses do more job creation than the Fortune 500 combined. Immigrants bring energy to this country. Now, I really don't think there is a Republican establishment. I think it died in 1966 when the New York Herald Tribune, which was the Republican establishment newspaper, went out of business. In 1964, my man Goldwater uh, got to the convention and the Republican establishment was powerful then. They ginned up a candidacy overnight. Bill Scranton of Pennsylvania, governor of Pennsylvania, Wonderful, decent guy, but the editors of Time Life and of the New York Herald Tribune and the Rockefellers of the Chase Manhattan Bank, that was a Republican establishment that could do things. There's no such establishment today. And uh, so, I, 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 but, you know, if you Google the phrase Republican establishment, you get a million hits. You Google Loch Ness Monster, you get a million hits, and the lo neither of them exists. 